traditional Texas chili. Traditional Texas chili. Well, it's pretty much set in stone that it's from San Antonio. Um, who invented it in San Antonio? There's some debate. Um, there's one theory that it was a nun that lived in San Antonio that had out of body experiences with Native Americans and she got this recipe um, pretty much as we make it but instead of beef it was venison. Um, there's another theory that um, it came from North Africans who were in the Canary Islands and then um, who moved to San Antonio which I have a hard time believing that one knowing African cuisine um, they're trying to say it's a tangine variant um, and then the last theory is that it's um, women from Mexico which in my opinion is more at the heart of the origins of Chile um, and what these ladies would do um, would be they would go home after working um, and they would make a giant pot of chili and then they would take it to the military base um, and then they would sell it like a street food um, and a street vendor and they would use the products available to them in that area which was chilies, um, sweet onions um, and beef um, and then the theory on beans being traditional in Chile is these same street vendors would sell pinto beans and chili and so the theory there is people would just put the beans that were separate in their chili and then it took off from there um, and it was a, a staple of San Antonio for over a hundred years um, it went to Chicago some big fair there in 1893 and that's where it really kicked off nationally um, and then that's where you get all your variants right what I'm showing you today with the beef is the original how it kind of all started and then the variants you see all over the country and world today are what people like in their chili um, which is something I want to explain on the chili side of that um, and the other ingredients that you can add to that really the recipe that you have for Texas chili is a perfect base for any type of chili you make poultry, vegan, beef, ground meat um, and then you add the things you like to that so if you like more chili powders or more variety of chilies do that um, some good examples are like a dry adobo chili, kind of like when you make your enchilada sauce. Um, some hatch chilies from New Mexico. Um, here's a poblano that I roasted and, and took the skin off. Here's a chipotle, which is only a roasted jalapeno. So if you didn't know, chipotle is just a roasted jalapeno. Um, you can go with um, um, serranos like this regular jalapenos like this here like we're going to put in our recipe um, if you don't like spicy you can do bell pepper um, and then on the dry chili side of that also don't forget canned green chilies um, on the dry side of that you've got tons of different chili powders right you got hot paprika which is all paprika is bell pepper um, you've got adobo, New Mexico chili, which is just this chili ground up. Guajillo chili, which was probably one of the major chilies used in San Antonio um, as a chili powder. Um, you know, I've added some of my other favorites. Um, here's a generic chili powder, Morton and Bassett, cayenne pepper, a chipotle chili powder, um, and a ground ancho chili, which has really good flavor too. Um, you could do a paste um, and like I said it doesn't have to be fresh it could be dry it could be just straight powders um, it's really your personal preference 
Um, but the base, what I'm teaching you today with the base of that recipe is um, really that just that. It's just the base that you will add flavors that you like to. Um, if you like tomato, put some tomato in there. I like to do, if I do tomato, I like a sauce. Um, because it blends right in, you can't tell there's tomato in there, but you have the flavor. So it looks more authentic. Um, as far as beans go, you can do um, just a regular pinto bean, a black bean, a kidney bean. Kidney beans, this is the only bean put in chili up north for some reason. Um, and now, Bush's has these chili starters, right? So it's a can of beans with um, your chili powders and some other seasonings and ingredients to kind of help kickstart the flavor of chili if you're not building and developing those flavors like we are um, today. So if you didn't have any time, you could grab a chili starter like this, throw it in some ground beef, and boom, you got a chili in 10 minutes. Um, it's just to make things easier. Um, they've also got this new one I found today, and it's it actually has Texas on there, um, but it really just looks like ranch style beans. Um, so there's some history and some theory. Um, we're gonna start cooking our um, beef chili, and beef chili is not traditionally ground beef. It's a um, just a whole muscle cut of beef that you will cut to tenderize. Today we're using a top sirloin, um, but you could use chuck, you could use tougher muscles if you have the time to simmer them to get tender. Um, or you could really, really um, drop a lot of money on it and put tenderloin or a ribeye or New York or something like that. But remember, when you do those tender cuts, they don't need to cook as long. So you don't want to disintegrate those high dollar cuts by cooking them too long um, because they're already tender. You, once you develop the flavor, it's pretty much ready. But if I use a, um, a round steak or something that's a little bit more tough, I'm going to need to simmer that for an hour or two to really get the tenderness um, to develop. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, I pre-cut the steak. Um, just into a small dice. You can kind of see it here. Um, nothing exact or perfect. You could go into a bigger chunk um, if you want. Um, that's about a pound. Actually, it's right on the money. Um, so there again, you can increase that or decrease that. But for a family of four, um, that's a pretty good portion, a pretty good base for a recipe. Um, and so that's how we're gonna start our chili. Um, it's very important this step that you have a really hot pan. You do not want um, to throw your meat into a cold pan, nor do you want to overcrowd your pan to where the meat develops moisture. You don't want to boil it until you add liquid to it. Um, and overcrowding your pan, a sure sign of knowing it's overcrowded is it starts developing moisture and uh, kind of boiling instead of searing and sauteing. Um, and the fats you use can make a difference in your overall flavor. For instance, um, Canola oil is a very light flavor, uh, an olive oil, which wouldn't be traditional, um, but does have good flavor and is very healthy. Or even some of your world famous chili recipes, you know, 50% or more have bacon fat in them or bacon of some kind. Um, like when you're talking about chili cook-offs and one of the major chili cook-offs in the country is Terlingua, um, which all started over a bet with a New Yorker, and, and we tied him somehow. Don't, don't, don't ask me how that happened. Um, they really limit those, your ingredients that you can use on um, your chilies. Like, you can't use onions 
um, you can't use fresh peppers and things like that. So you have to do dry ingredients. So instead of onions, onion powder. Instead of jalapenos, maybe a little extra chili powders. Um, you just have to stay in their rules to, to qualify and complete those. For this one, I'm just gonna use some canola. Um, I'm putting this in a ceramic coated Dutch oven. Um, a regular stainless steel saucepan works fine. Um, if you have a stain, uh, cast iron um, Dutch oven and you really like making chili, just make that Dutch oven your chili only um, cast iron and it'll, it'll season itself and over the years it will make some amazing chili that you cannot um, recreate without that pan. Um, kind of like cornbread and things like that where people are religious with their use of certain tools in the kitchen. Um, I like um, cast iron personally, um, but I only have one. And um, another good tip is if you don't want to do this on the stove and it's a nice day outside, get your barbecue pit going real good and then put your pan out there and do your chili on the barbecue pit and it'll get a real nice smoky flavor um, and really add a lot to your um, finished product. Okay, so I'm gonna put in the beef. And you can tell by the sound alone that it's hot. And what we're trying to do is, is caramelize the beef and get a nice reddish brown color and then that's going to also leave what's called fond on the bottom of the pan. That's the dark sugars that stick when the meat is caramelizing. Um, and this is how you build flavors in classic culinary cuisine. Um, you go through different stages of bringing out flavors of things and um, really, really adds a lot to your finished product. Um, now, you don't want to go until it's like crunchy, crispy. When I get a good piece caramelized here, I'll show y'all. Um, you know, ha part of this one is done. Should I go to the small one? So you can see on that, it's got a nice chocolate color to it. Um, a little golden. Beef is red, so it doesn't really turn golden like chicken does, but you still get that Ma Maillard reaction caramelization. Um, and that's very important uh, for flavor. Right? So we're going to let that sear. And then I'm going to show you real quick the proper way to, um, to clean an onion. And forgive me if I'm boring you and you already know this. Um, if I am dicing an onion, I'm just gonna cut off the tail, which is the flowering end of the onion. And then I'm gonna cut it in half through the root ball. And I'm gonna leave that root ball on there. And I'll tell you why. When I get a little bit further, if I'm slicing an onion, I'm gonna cut the tail and um, the top off. Um, and you see how much easier it is to clean an onion when it's cut in half? Because slicing is a little bit different than dicing. And I'm only showing you the slice for information purposes. Um, so that you um, have that in your, in your tool kit, so to speak, right? Okay, so slicing, the top and tail are off. I'm going to turn it to where the veins of the onion are vertical to me. And I like to start with my knife kind of down low. And I just rock it over. And I'm just going to go all the way to the center, a little past center. And then I'm going to lay that down because it's much easier to control. And then, boom, you got a nice sliced onion. Um, for dinner or whatever you're cooking you can save it for later it'll hold for about four days in your um, 
fridge, depending on how good a shape the onion is uh, when you use it. For dicing, we're gonna grab the one that still has the root ball on it. Okay, and we're gonna turn our knife sideways, perpendicular to the board. We're not gonna cut all the way through. We're gonna leave some on there. And then I'm just gonna go a little bit higher, and same thing, don't go all the way through. Just pretty close. And you know, the thickness that you cut this way is the kind of the size of the dice you'll end up with. And now I'm gonna turn it to where the veins are kind of vertical again. And I'm just gonna cut through it in the center. I don't really need to cut it on the sides because it's already the way that the onion is layered. You don't have to mess with slicing all the way um, from one side to the other, just really in the middle. Actually that top piece, um, if you just slice through all that little top piece, you're, you're, you've got a good dice. Now I'll turn it horizontal again, and I'll just go through it, and boom. You get a nice dice, easy peasy, you're not messing with rings or an onion rolling around on you, um, things like that. So I hope that helps. Um, and so there's our onion. These jalapenos, all I did was cut them in a quarter and then just turn them vertical or horizontal and, and chopped them. For the garlic, almost the same thing. Okay, I'm just gonna turn that off because it's ready to show you, but I wanna show you the garlic real fast. Okay, don't mess around. If you're shopping with those 50 cent traditional garlic cloves, they're fine, they taste good. It's really a matter of patience and how much cleaning do you want to do. Um, I buy the elephant garlic, which is this big one. Um, it's $3, but you probably get as much garlic out of a couple cloves as you do out of a whole clove that's 50 cents. And then you end up with this giant clove that is super easy to dice just like we did the onion, right? Don't go all the way through and take your time. Um, I've been using a knife for a long time, long, long time. So don't feel like you have to do it as fast as me or as, as good as me. Um, if you like using a little paring knife, a smaller knife, um, that's great. Um, if you don't like even messing with garlic, um, the best thing to do in that case is um, to buy it already chopped, right? So you can buy it minced like this, which is fine. I have some in my fridge. You can buy a garlic paste like this. Um, very good um, and easy. And then the produce sections, most um, grocery stores will have other derivatives of garlic paste and things like that. Okay, I'm gonna bring this over now and kind of show you the caramelization. Whoa. And uh, the colors. You can see the fond on the bottom, right? We're about to pick that up with our vegetables. So once you've got a good sear on your meat, put that back in the, uh, on the fire. And then we're gonna deglaze with our vegetables. And it's the same as deglazing with the liquid, except that you have to wait for the liquid and the vegetables to come out um, to do its job, right? And I'm, I'm a, a, a traditionalist, but I'm also a, um, an expediter of time. So I'm showing you a one pot method way of doing this. Um, if you prefer, you can pull the meat out and then do the vegetables and then make your roux and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in, in, in the case of the traditional recipe and the recipe that I shared with everyone, um, I put in my onion and jalapeno and put in some garlic. On the recipe it says uh, all vegetables, so there's what, jalapeno, onion, and garlic. 
and that's it. So, real simple. Not a lot of uh, variety because we're not using beans or tomatoes. Um, if I was going to put tomatoes in this, I would add it after these vegetables, the onion, pepper, and garlic. Um, kind of caramelize and sweat and turn a little more translucent. And then I'll add the um, tomatoes or tomato sauce. One thing to keep in mind too, when you're mixing your roux into this mixture, um, you don't want to cook your vegetables too far along because um, you have to cook the bitterness out of the flour, which takes a few minutes. So once you start to see it sweat and the aromatics come out and you can smell it, um, go ahead and add your flour. I think it calls for a half cup. This is a masa flour. So um, a little more traditional, right? Because corn would have been way more available in Texas than wheat, especially down there. Um, and you know, originally Texas was just part of Mexico, so. Um, the culture they have south of the border today is similar to the one they had above the border then. Um, okay, let me show you all again what this kind of looks like. Watch your heat when you're doing the roux. You do not want to burn it. Um, you just want to cook the bitterness out of it. Okay, and then here, looking again. You can see that the roux is coated all the vegetables and the meat. And now all we're doing is trying to um, cook the bitterness out of the roux, um, which only takes four or five minutes. Um, and it's plenty hot enough off the fire, you can see, to work as well. So if you're not comfortable doing your roux over the flame, just turn it off and, and stir it around for a while. You only need to stir if it's burning, but... Um, so you have to be careful because that roux is a binder and it's sticky and starchy, so it will stick to your pan. Uh, and it doesn't stir real well uh, unless you have um, a lot of oil, which I'm not a, a opposed to, but we're really not trying to make a real greasy chili at the same time. Um, Using a whole muscle meat like this really helps um, um, prevent that greasiness, right? If you're using ground beef, it's 20% fat at least, unless you buy the lean stuff, and even then it's 10 or 5%, which is way more than a whole muscle would be. Um, so keep that in mind. If you're doing a ground beef instead of a whole muscle like this, cook the meat and then drain the fat off and then put it back on the stove and continue the process. That way you don't have a big, thick layer of artery clogging animal fat, okay? Um, okay, I think we've got pretty good. You can also cook the bitterness out of the flour um, after you add the liquid. So if your pan's too hot and you see it burning, just hurry up and add your um, your broth and your beer, um, sorry, I might have skipped a step, to prevent it from burning, right? It, it'll still cook the bitterness out, it'll just take a little bit longer. Um, okay, now we're gonna do the spices and seasonings, and I've already got them mixed up here. I got some Mexican oregano here. Oregano, by the way, translated is joy of the mountain, because oregano is a Greek word. I know, I'm weird. Um, and I've added some like chili flakes to this and yeah. Um, just like the recipe says, a uh, tablespoon of the paprika, three tablespoons of chili powder, a teaspoon of cumin, um, and a teaspoon of oregano. And the reason I'm adding those now with the roux and the oils is because um, dry spices really have to get hot for those flavors and the oils and the spice to come out. So the longer you cook a dry spice, the better the flavor will be, 
and uh, the more intense the flavor will be. Now, if you're cooking with a fresh spice, you want to um, add those later because you don't need to cook them for a long time to bring those flavors out. All right, some oregano, some black pepper. Oh, I forgot to mention, it has been years since I forgot to put salt and pepper on a recipe. And I forgot to put salt and pepper on this recipe. Um, my rules on salt and pepper is always to taste. What is your personal preference? If you think that's enough salt, perfect. Um, if not, keep adding it until you're happy with it, okay? Um, and I apologize for that, and I can get you on an updated recipe. Um, I, I kicked myself in the butt plenty hard for it. Um, okay, so give you all another gander at the at what we've gotten so far. Got all those spices mixed in. We got a nice fond on the bottom. We're fixing to pull that off completely with our beer and um, broth. Okay. Um, Shiner wasn't around then, but it um, is a Texas beer and it is German and there's a strong German population in that area. So any kind of German beer will be fine. Uh, even a Mexican beer would be fine. Um, um, just don't use it. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you really wanted to, maybe some tequila or something, but whew, that stuff is so potent. I wouldn't use very much uh, at all. Um, but it's just as good without the beer as it is with the beer. The beer just gives it a little more depth. The alcohol does, yes. Okay, so that's about three cups. There's about that much left. I like the Pacific brand. They have a really good um, product. Okay. And now, we're just gonna continue to stir it and to bring all that fond off the bottom with our liquids going here. And uh, we're just gonna let it be a kind of a medium simmer. So you got a pretty good amount of bubbles and they're popping pretty regularly. Um, the one thing you wanna keep an eye on at this point is that your flour to liquid ratio is balanced, right? Because if, if we have too much roux in there, it's gonna get way too thick and we'll have to add more liquids. Um, if there isn't enough flour in there, the best way to fix that, in my opinion, is just to kind of cook it a little bit hotter and let it reduce down and it will get thick once you get past a certain point on your um, moisture content, right? Um, you can see here, this has not started to thicken. But I'm going to show you all again so you all can see it. This has not started to thicken. But it's all kind of come together, right? We have a nice slurry, um, you know, not too thick yet, but it will. As soon as it boils, that starch is going to react and it's just going to get thicker and thicker and thicker the longer it boils. Um, so to help with things over thickening, also you can turn that heat down um, and it'll slow down that process a little bit. But the easiest thing to do is just add more broth or water. Uh, um, and that is traditional um, Texas chili. And we're gonna let that simmer and thicken. And while that's doing that, I'm gonna show y'all a turkey variant and a vegan variant um, using the same base. But on these, I will add some other products to give you a little inspiration maybe, and a little, or a few more ideas, okay? Okay, so ignore my messy board now. I've already cut the chick, the turkin. The chick turkin, the turkey. Um, and again, I'm gonna get my pan hot. On this one, I'm gonna use a little bit of bacon fat instead of oil. Um, we're going to add some tomato to this one, and I have fresh, and I have canned, 
um, up to you. It's always easier to open a can. Um, but if you want better knife skills, use fresh. Um, the general rule of thumb, better food is fresher food. Um, in my world of culinary theory and, and ego, no, just kidding. Okay, so we're just waiting for this to get hot. And we'll add uh, our fat and then we'll sear our meat. And then we will add our other ingredients and that one will be going and then we'll do a vegan. And the vegan one's really weird. Um, you th you're like oatmeal, ah, uh, I, I did pretty well with this. It gets meats in a chili competition here on campus. Um, so it can still taste really good and not be what you're used to. I've won with the turkey recipe. Um, it's really good. And it can be ground, it can be cubed like this. I like more of the whole muscle. Um, you could use chicken, quail, deer, in uh, pretty much any protein you want. Um, um, chili isn't really, there are no rules, so to speak, unless you're a true traditionalist or you're competing in a traditional chili cook-off, right? Um, everyone likes it their own way and everybody has their own opinion on what makes the best chili and um, we all have our different preferences and things, right? Okay, so we got this pan hot, put in some of the bacon grease, because I always save, I always save my bacon grease because that's money that we don't need to throw away. Um, and can be used again, and it holds just fine. Um, that was probably over a pound, but it's okay. Okay, now this will sear much faster. Uh, it won't take very long, and then we'll go right in with our garlic, onions, and peppers. And then we'll do our little roux thing. And then we'll add our chili powders. And on this one, I want to do, I said the tomato, but I want to do, I think this poblano that I roasted. Um, Cause I love the flavor of poblano. Um, it's such a nice pepper. Um, it's a tough pepper, it's hard to work with. And unless you skin it, uh, it's a pain to even cut. But the way to skin a chili is you burn the skin on a stove or with a torch until it's black. Then you'll put it in a Ziploc and let it sweat. After that cools down, you can pull it out and take a, a paper towel like this, wipe all the black off, rinse it, and it's done. Um, and then you have a much more palatable pepper and, and a better flavor. Woo! squirting in my eyes um, this is a juicy one okay so I want to put some poblano in this one we're still gonna do the jalapeno I think on our vegan one we'll try some serranos and maybe that chili paste um, we might even put some of these green chilies in our um, what did I do with that can over we might even put these in our turkey too. Okay. What happened to my fire? Okay, let this come back up. Um, I'll show everybody the beef chili again so you can kind of see what stage we're at. Okay, we got a nice, you can see the thickness in the bubbles. Thank you. And, uh, it's starting to get a nice thickness to it, right? That's a good balance of roux to liquid, is that it doesn't get thick too fast, right? Like when you're making cream gravy at home and you have way more roux than you do milk, um, um, it's like insta-thick, and then you spend the rest of the time thinning it out with your milk, right? It's a lot better if you can um, 
get your ratio correct so that um, it, it kind of thickens slowly and comes together right at the end. Um, you'll have a better finished product. So these are just my old chopped green chilies, Hatch, Poblano, the jalapeno, Okay, just going to let that sear. Um, and then we've got our onions, garlic, and then I said we were going to do tomato. We'll do a uh, fresh tomato in this one. Okay, to a slice and dice a tomato, there, there's not really an easy way unless you have the tool. Um, the easiest tomatoes to do that are Roma tomatoes like this, which are more of an Italian style. It's funny they call them Italian because Italy didn't even have tomatoes until the 1700s. So now we're going to deglaze our turkey pan, mix in our chilies. Let those start caramelizing and becoming aromatic. Let me give you all another sneak peek of our beef chili. You can see how that's thickening nicely, starting to come together real well. We're just going to let that continue to simmer. And you could probably see the way that was simmering a little bit, even though I pulled it off the stove. That's a good temperature. Um, stick with that. Okay. Now we'll add our dry chilies. Um, something to keep in mind too. When you make turkey chili, the color is not going to be what you're used to with beef chili. So you may add more chili powders. And if you don't want to go with the more bitter chili flat powders like um, adobo, guajillo, New Mexico, use paprika. Because it's really hard to make a bell pepper bitter. So you can get the color without changing the flavor too much by using paprika. Because um, you can see this one is <coughs> sorry I got a whiff of chili there um, way way lighter right so to look more like a traditional chili just grab my paprika You know, and we got a lot more red there. But really, I don't go too crazy with the color on a poultry grape, uh, poultry chili like that until it's uh, near completion, right? Because it's easier to fix the color at the end um, than to add too much in the beginning and then you're trying to repair your recipe the whole time, right? Oh, I forgot to put the oregano joy of the mountain. I like the Mexican oregano. Um, you can kind of see how chunky it is. It's not so leafy. You really get the little flower buds and it's a little more, there's more depth of flavor in it. Um, and it's actually like way cheaper than the Morton and Bassett and some of the name brand spices, McCormick, things like that. Um, okay, our chili is looking good. I'm kind of watering in my mouth a little bit. Um, okay, it's time to add our flour to the turkey. About a half cup, not too much. I'm gonna do beer in this one. Um, but you could leave it out. Like I'll leave the beer out of the um, the vegan one because what's beer made from? Mm-hmm. What are we making the chili out of? Mm-hmm. So we don't want too much oats. Um, we want it to be a little more, uh, you know, you don't want to just overdo any flavor too much, right? Okay. 
So I'll show you the turkey. You know, it's developed a nice roux around the meat. It's kind of thick. We're just gonna cook it for a couple minutes. Turn my fire down. And I'm gonna turn my fire down on the beef because I'm gonna show you what level of um, simmer we're at. Those bubbles are starting to get big and there's less of them. That's an instant indicator that it's, it's uh, getting thick quick. All right, so we're just gonna turn it down a little bit more because we just want that nice, steady bubbles. We don't want it to roil too much. Okay, we got our turkey in here. And now for the um, turkey broth, I, don't, I didn't buy the broth, but I have base and water, so that's what I'm gonna do. Um, here's a good tip for y'all that you might not have thought of. Um, this water that we've been soaking these chilies in has a good flavor to it. More flavor than water by itself does. So we'll use that with our chicken base. And chicken base is just a bouillon, okay? It's a concentrated flavor. Um, maybe we'll put some adobo in there too. We needed three cups, so these deli containers are four and that had a lot of peppers in it, it wasn't quite full. Okay. And now we're just gonna stir it up, get it smooth, and then let it let it simmer. Oh, forgot our tomatoes. Never too late for the tomatoes. Do keep in mind though, they are tender. You don't wanna cook them to disintegrate, to disintegration or anything, you know? And the more tomatoes you like, the more you can put in there. Um, I wouldn't be opposed to even some fresh herbs on this one, like cilantro um, or some parsley, something like that. Um, that would be good. And then at this point too is where you would add cooked beans um, to your chili. Unless you had a dry bean only and then you would put that more into the beginning of the process like immediately after adding the liquid. And then hopefully you have a tougher cut of muscle that needs to cook about as long as the bean does and then you can cook them together. Um, but it's way easier to just open a can of good beans and put them in. And if you're gonna buy beans, you can't beat bushes. It's the best canned bean there is. Um, they don't pay me to say that. Um, that's just from experience and product knowledge of all of the different manufacturers and their tricks and things like that. Um, for instance, their black beans don't have dye in them to make them black. That's huge, that's why they're a little more purple. The cheaper ones have black dye in them to make them black. So they're cheaper and they're blacker, but is that better for you, you know? Okay, I'm gonna show you all this turkey chili now. So you can really see the poblano in there. And yeah. And uh, you know, really color looks like a Mexican flag almost. Okay. What about it? Oh, he's just saying it's good to go. Oh, okay. Okay. No problem. Um, so traditionally, this traditional beef chili, when the ladies would sell it, it would be like tortilla, usually corn. Um, flour is not a big item in South America. You can ask almost anybody from down there, would you like a flour or corn? And every time, corn. Um, and then it evolved into some of your, um, you know, it wasn't just the little old ladies making chili, it was your average Joe, and some of those that were successful in the Houston area started giving you all the saltine crackers you could eat with your chili. Kind of like they do with chips at the Mexican restaurant. Right? And so that's kind of how crackers got brought into the fold. Um, another 
thing that will probably surprise everybody. Those same little ladies made or invented Frito Pie. They're the ones that came up with the idea of putting the chili on the chips. Okay, so we're simmering on beef, we're simmering on turkey. Am I flying? Or do I still have time? Okay, so just to start the vegan one, uh, I've already been trying to give that one away before I even made it, and there's no takers. Um, but it is pretty good. And if you're vegan, they will love it. Um, I promise you. So we're gonna get that pan hot. No animal products of any kind, so don't even look at bacon grease for the vegan chili, okay? But since it's kind of a lighter flavor, you're not getting any umami flavors, which is the fifth flavor, by the way. Um, it's been around for a couple years now, um, which is a meat, earthy, nutty flavor. So we have bitter, sweet, sour, salty, umami. Um, because there's not a lot of umami flavors in this because it's an oatmeal, we're gonna use a extra virgin olive oil. So extra virgin olive oil should be green like this. It should never ever be like this, right? So this is a this is a pure olive oil. It's been pressed one time. It should be yellow. That's what it should look like. It's a lighter flavor. You can cook anything in it and it won't change the flavor too much like eggs, but if you ever cooked eggs in extra virgin olive oil, you know that this oil imparts a very olivey flavor to the egg, which isn't, doesn't always contrast well with each other. Um, so when you buy extra virgin olive oil, make sure it's green. Don't get ripped off. Because if they tell you this is extra virgin and they're charging you for pressing it three times, but they only pressed it once, you're getting ripped off. It should be green like this. And it will only develop this green color after it's been pressed more than one time. And technically, pure is pressed once, virgin is pressed twice, extra virgin is pressed three times. Okay, we got a hot pan. We got our um, olive oil. We do not need to sear our oatmeal. So we're gonna go straight to the veggies. Okay. That's the onion. We got some garlic. I'm gonna put a little extra garlic in there because we need a little extra flavor in this recipe. Um, our jalapenos, not as much as we put in the others. So let me cut up a serrano real fast. Seeds and all. Just don't use the stem. Put those in there. I think, I think a little adobo would be nice. So since these have been rehydrated, sitting in hot water for a couple hours. They're nice and easy to slice and dice and whatever else. And if you notice, I grabbed that towards the bottom so I wouldn't get a whole lot of seeds. But the seeds aren't necessarily a bad thing in chili. Right, so we got those in there. Be careful not to use my meat fork in the vegan, or my meat spoon in the vegan one. Stir that up real good. Man, cooking a bunch of hot chilies is like spraying your face with mace. Okay, so be careful. It'll choke you up. Um, Let's see, what else? We need our dry spices, oregano. And then now that I have all those flavors in there, let's do a little black pepper, a little salt on this one. We need a little salt in our turkey too. I try not to season it too much with salt until it's finished because you don't want to over season it. Um, and certain things you never want to use salt until it's cooked, like rice, beans. Never ever put salt in your beans until they're finished, okay? And let's open up these for our vegan. I'm gonna turn that down, I can hear it. These are little plum 
Roma tomatoes, but they'll call them plum. And it has a nice sauce. Um, and it's basically a whole Roma that's been peeled, so you don't have to worry about the skin. Because the skin will always separate and float on top and look like crap. Okay, and we're using quite a bit more tomato for flavor as well. We're gonna put in our oatmeal now. We're gonna stir that up. You do not need any flour or any roux for the oatmeal chili because uh, what does oatmeal do when you boil it, right? It does it for us without having the need of the flour. Um, would anyone like to see our beef chili now? It's looking amazing. Yo, wait, I'll try to video these two fighting for it when this is over, okay? You see that? Nice consistency. Nice thickness. And if I want more thickness, I'll just keep cooking it. Another good tip is all this fawn that develops on the side, work that back in. That's concentrated flavor that's only going to add more flavor to the chili we've been working on the last hour. Right. Okay. Our turkey is not quite that thick, but you can see it's starting to get thicker. Um, it's got a great aroma to it. And turkey honestly makes a really good chili. It's an awesome substitute for beef um, in chili. Um, if it wasn't for the color, you could people would never know um, most times. Okay, so you can see our um, uh, oatmeal chili, how thick it has gotten with just the moisture from the vegetables and the tomato sauce. And then on this one, I just got uh, a vegetable stock store shelf shelf bot. It's super simple to make your own vegetable stock. Put vegetables, trimmings, um, whatever you like, and some water, and simmer it for 30 minutes. Excuse me, 30 minutes, and you're you've got an awesome vegetable stock. And then and that way you can put the vegetables you like more of, right? Like carrots or onion or leeks, um, anything like that that you like. Celery, um, but it's really easy to make vegetable stock and if you don't, if you buy a lot at the store, just save your tomato ends and your celery ends, carrot ends, and make it yourself. You get a little bit more for your money um, and you're a little more holistic in your um, diet, right? Okay, that's doing nicely. Turkey's starting to get thick. The beef is, woo! Looks amazing. It's pretty much ready. Um, I want to show you all this vegan one, just so you can kind of see it during the process. I guarantee you, vegan chili will not be something that people come asking for and uh, wanting. But anyone who is vegan, and if you love them enough, they will truly, truly appreciate that you made them chili without any animal products. Um, and it, it really does taste like beef chili and, and turkey chili, minus a little bit of that umami flavor. But it really does taste like chili. I submitted this once for a, for a chili cook-off, and it did all right but everybody likes their meat better. But it was still pretty strong for a vegan. <laughs> I was surprised. Um, and vegan's a hot topic right now with most of our student population. Um, I will tell you from experience that it's not the healthiest. Um, it is maybe the most humane, but it's not the healthiest. And if you are vegan, Take your vitamins, take your minerals, supplement your diet where you're not getting it from your food, okay? And one more look at the beef chili. And those are our chilies. Um, feel free to anybody who was watching this and has any questions to email me. Um, I'm more than happy to help you. Um, share recipes, um, techniques, things like that. 
If you have any questions now, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, and I hope you guys enjoyed our little demo.